Morning, happy Sabbath. I'm going to go ahead and take that off if that's all right. I'll try not to breathe too much on you. Um, <clears throat> anyway, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about prayer, and it seemed appropriate that we would be talking about prayer and meditation. So that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit about. Wow, do I need to turn this? All right, sorry. Can you guys still hear me? All right, good. So we'll be talking a little bit about what meditation is, and there's going to be a whole bunch of opinion thrown in there because of what I think meditation is. Um, but then also we'll talk about a few different things of what maybe isn't good biblical meditation, and then we'll wrap it up at the end, um, talk about one of my favorite stories, which I think um, represents meditation uh, the way it should be. So <clears throat> why don't we have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank you for um, the words that you share. And Lord, we pray that um, at this moment you would share your words through me, um, that everyone in here would be blessed by hearing. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your teaching. And Lord, we pray that um, we can enjoy this message together and enjoy the Sabbath together. In your holy name we pray, amen. So, all right, so that's working. So did you, you know, out of all the things that I've done in my life, um, you know, uh, going to school, uh, getting a job, do you know that I actually 
tried getting a job in, in teaching meditation. Yeah. It didn't work out, though, because I had a bad inner view. <laughs> inner view. Just so you get it. OK. No, nah, seriously, though, you know, I thought about getting into meditation. Um, <clears throat> just a second. You know, I figured it'd be, you know, better than sitting around doing nothing all day. That's, that was another one. But that one was, sorry, you know, I'm not good at the long jokes that everybody tells, and they're so good. You know, they lead you through this story. I like the one-liners and the puns. Those are the best ones, I think. And it's, sadly, I don't have children, but I think I would be, like, a great dad, having great dad jokes all the time. So, but in all seriousness, though, Growing up, uh, meditation for me was something that was a little bit weird. The idea of it. You know, we'd see it on TV. Uh, or, you know, we, it's something that we thought only people who did yoga or um, kung fu masters or zen masters, we, we always thought it was something that only they did. But the Bible actually calls us to meditate. So in Joshua 1.8, uh, read this with me. It says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Joshua 1.8. So, you know, people have this idea of, of meditation being like sitting around, cross-legged, giving your okay signs, and just like saying, um... And it's kind of funny, when I was mentioning to people that I was going to preach and preach on this subject, that's what I got. Those were the kind of uh, reactions that I got. Even my brother, who's a pastor, the first thing he said was, um, you know, he didn't even say anything else. He just started humming. Um, but at the core of meditation, it is something pretty simple. I think it's reading on the Bible, reading the Bible, focusing on small portions of it, and then you know, praying and having God reveal what is written in his word. Um, and why would I think that anything like that would be bad? You know, the Bible's talking about it. But there is this idea, and this is, this is my opinion, um, but, and it also has to do with the way that I grew up. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, there's things that we do, and how do I say this? It's like, you know, for example, when, when um, you'd see people pray, and you'd be kneeling, but then you'd see some people bowing their face to the ground. Or sometimes when we're praising, you know, we're singing, some people are praying, and then you'd see some people with their hands raised up in the air, praising God, which are both completely acceptable forms of worship. But somehow, it's be, you know, like... I've seen that we've gotten where, you know, the, you know, maybe the Pentecostals or whoever, they do that. So, you know, we don't do that kind of stuff. Or uh, Eastern religion, they bow, they put their face to the ground. So we don't do that. And I think meditation kind of got that same bad rap because of um, who was doing it. You know, we'd say, no, we, we probably don't do that because they're doing it. And so I guess it's guilty by association. But meditation is supremely important. And, you know, I got to admit, I didn't really think too much about it. You know, I just think, you know, I have to have this communion with God. Um, prayer is good enough. Reading his word. But there's a little bit more to it. Um, meditation um, and prayer, they go hand in hand. Otherwise, our spiritual life and our relationship with God are unbalanced. The way that I kind of think of it is uh, like breathing. So we pray. Let's look at that as like a breathing out. You know, we're lifting up our, our cares, our needs, our desires to God. But then there's this whole breathing in. God is also giving you stuff, giving you things to think about, working on you. And that's the breathing in. Um, one thing I thought about this morning, and it's from a conversation that I had a long time ago with somebody, and I think it, it might have been Mark. Um, but in Hebrew thought, 
or this is what he said. I, I didn't check on it. But in Hebrew thought, you know that, um, I think it's the Tetragrammaton, the YHWH, what we commonly say is Yahweh. But it's YHWH, all consonants, no vowels. And there was an idea that, um, you know, when you pronounce that, it just sounds like, like a breath. So in every single breath, you know, we are praising God. God is on our lips. I thought it was a beautiful thought. I don't know how much that pertains to what I'm talking about today, but speaking about breathing and breath in, in the context of prayer and meditation, I thought it was it fit. Um, so the reason I decided to talk about, or I call this spiritual tune-ups, um, is because I kind of thought about it as like the tuning of an instrument. Like, have you ever seen a tuner tune a piano? Yeah, I mean, I know a few of you have pianos at home. You've seen it. But, you know, the, you know, the Bible, I think I might have made a slide for it. Okay. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. And that's the way I kind of think about being in tune, is praying without ceasing. Let me explain. So as the, you know, the, the, the tuner is working on that instrument, um, let me get this right, because I think I already, yeah. So I look at that lever, you know, that tuning lever as a continual prayer in my heart. Um, when I don't have that constant communion with God, the, the, the noise that comes out sounds a bit off. You know, I almost think about those old, like if you've seen the old Western movies and you hear like the person playing the piano, the, there's a tune that's coming out, but it sounds horrible. Something's off. And I think when we do that, you know, when we play our instrument, play us with, with that untuned heart, I mean, sin goes unchecked. Our actions, our words, our life is not in tune with, with God's word and with what he says. And so every time we, we play, it's just like the clanking of a loose string, if that makes sense, instead of being a beautiful melody. But constant communion doesn't mean crawling on our knees all day, but it's taking our needs, our cares, our desires, that's that breathing out to him, and also walking with him, listening to his responses, breathing in, <clears throat> and letting him lead. We are meant to walk in an attitude of prayer, filling the moments of our life, reaching out to him, praising him, reading his word, and listening to his voice. And as we stay in constant communion with the Lord, through prayer and meditation, the Spirit of God lays his finger on our sin and says, you know, right here, this is sin. And then like the tuner, even though it's uncomfortable, he tightens the string. And we are confronted with our sin. And when we can call it what it is, when we can admit to sin and call sin what it is, you know, he tightens the string. And then we can have this beautiful melody play out in tune. So let's go a little bit deeper. What is meditation? So throughout scripture, meditation is always active, never passive, and always has an object. The goal of Christian meditation comprises filling the mind with the word and the works of God, meditating upon his greatness and matchless love. We are changed into his image, 2 Corinthians 3.18. In Christian meditation, we look out of ourselves to him. Jesus is our object. Jesus is the object of our thoughts and the focus, the supreme focus of our attention. Our hope is in him. Our mind is fixed upon him. Our attention is focused upon him. And when meditating upon him, we are transformed into his like likeness. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. The psalmist speaks of meditating on God's word his law, his testimonies, his works. He also meditates upon God's precepts, 
contemplates his ways. Christian meditation thus focus our thoughts on the grandeur and the greatness of God, lifting us from what is around us and what is within us to what is above us. Ellen White uses the term meditate about 569 times, describing the importance of filling our minds with the word of God in active meditation, she states, I think I have a slide. We must constantly, we must be constantly meditating upon the word, eating it, digesting it, and by practice assimilating it, so that it is taken into life current. Councils on Food and Diet. The significant factor in both biblical and Mrs. White's counsel on meditation is that they're always rooted in God's word, God's works and his ways, and anchored in his character, his power, his majesty, and his love. Meditation's goal is not to enter into the silence of the soul, somehow magically dwelling in, in God's presence. That's not how it works. But it's to actively engage the mind into focusing upon the matchless charms of his love and the amazing wonders of his grace. In the high technological frantic pace of our 21st century lives, true biblical meditation is, could become a lost art. The prophet Isaiah reminds us, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah 30, 15. <coughs> Thoughtfully opening God's word, reading a few verses, meditating upon his love and contemplating his character, and reflecting upon his greatness are life-changing. The Holy Spirit speaks to us in these quiet moments. I know that's kind of small, but let's see if you can read with me. When every other voice is hushed, and in, the quiet, and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us, be still and know that I am God, Psalms 46.10. This is the effectual prep preparation for all labor for God. Amidst the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded by, with an atmosphere of light and peace. He will receive a new endowment of both physical and mental strength. His life will breathe out a fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts. Ministry of Healing. She also uses the word contemplation a lot, too, about 580 times. <coughs> it's used similarly to meditation, which means, you know, and it means being pensive, attentive, uh, thoughtful, reflective. Here's another quote. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us, just as surely as if we could hear it with our ears. If we realize this, with what awe we would open God's word, and with what earnestness we would search its precepts. The reading and contemplation of the scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the infinite one, our great treasure house, signs of the times. Oh, and I have another one to follow. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry, I thought I just turned off everything. All right. In the Bible, a boundless field is open for the imagination. The student will come from a contemplation of its grand themes, from association with its lofty imagery, more pure and elevated in thought and feeling than if he had spent time reading any work of a mere human origin to say nothing of those of a trifling character. <clears throat> and this is probably the most well-known, um, the next quote is the most well-known that you've probably heard uh, her say about contemplation and meditation. And that is here in The Desire of Ages where it says, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. 
our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would say, if, if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Contemplating the cross draws us into an intimate relationship with Jesus, providing a solid foundation for our faith. Neither Mrs. White or the Bible um, speak of a, a meditation or a contemplation being aimless or mindless in some kind of trance-like state, you know, trance-like state of oneness with God. That's not how it is. In Scripture, the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible speaks through the divinely inspired word to transform our lives as we prayerfully meditate upon its passages. Jesus stated plainly when he declared, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And that's John 6, 6 3, 63. The apostle Peter adds, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, 2 Peter 1.4. And then James declares, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, James 1.21. Our characters are transformed as we actively meditate on God's word. The Bible writers also described, described the life-changing power of contemplating God's creative works. The point of these divinely inspired writers is the same. Christian meditation does not seek to empty the mind, but it seeks to fill it. It does not seek oneness with the mystical God within, but seeks to understand more deeply the nature of God who created and redeemed us. And then we can more fully reflect his character. And one of the things that's kind of goes without saying, but I, I can't believe I didn't put it anywhere in this sermon, and I just made a note here, is that one of the keys to this whole meditation thing is that you need to be spending time in God's word. Um, it's something that I just think everybody does. But that might not be the case. We need to spend time in God's word and prayer in, for this to work. Hopefully you guys are following me so far. I'm sorry. This made a whole bunch of sense in my mind when I put it together. So, I mean, hopefully you guys are following with some of the thoughts that I have. Um, there's another idea also in, med in meditation that I wanted to bring out um, and I, that I came across, and I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so the Hebrew language gives us a clue to the importance of meditation or the meditative practice. In Hebrew, the word soul, neshama, has the same base root as the word for breath, neshi, is it neshima, which is kind of cool. And I found this guy, Yitzhak Buxbaum, and he says, Our breath leads us to think of God, for it is connected with him, and is good evidence of our direct dependence of him at every moment of our life. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> to take it a step further, too, the words, I mean, they're just like anything else. There's multiple words that they used in Hebrew that mean somewhat the same thing. So there's sika, which I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and aga. And so, you know, we've been talking about... Um, Meditation, sika means meditation, reflection, prayer, devotion, complaint, musing. Um, and then aga also means to meditate, but to roar, to growl, to groan, to imagine, to utter, and to speak. So um, I came across this guy that was talking. I really liked what he had to say. He, oh, that's not the right one. So, okay, well, Proverbs 18.21 just says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And this is what I thought was a, just a cool thought. He said, you know, too many times we use our words to speak death. And then he took it a step further. He said, not only, it's not that we necessarily speak death, but we speak words that do not bring life. 
And he says, we as believers need to intentionally use our tongues to speak words of life. And let me ask you, where do you find words of life? In the word of God. So um, looking back at that uh, Joshua 1.8 in the beginning, and thinking about that word aga, to have the, the words on your tongue, you know, speaking, you know, we keep the words not just on our hearts, but on our lips as well. It needs to be spoken, it needs to be heard, and it needs to be shared. Um, one cool thing, so now I'm going to transition a little bit uh, into maybe some of the things that we need to be careful of when we're thinking about meditation. Because when you think about meditation, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a whole nother side to it. And I came across this guy, and he was from Malaysia. Um, Malaysia? His name is uh, uh, Kakto Yip. Yes, okay, I said it right. Or maybe. But um, anyway, no, but I, it was ran, I was just reading, you know, trying to find some material, and I didn't realize that he's an Adventist. And so for 37 years, he grew up Taoist, and he was a, he led out in Zen meditation, and then at 37 became an Adventist. Kind of cool. But I'm going to describe what he describes. Um, so he was mentioning that, you know, they would be in that cross-legged, you know, sitting there, breathing, doing breathing exercises, trying to remove all the thoughts from their mind. Um, sometimes they'd be counting one to ten over and over and over again for hours. No thoughts. That was the key. No thoughts. And he, he also mentioned, you know, then sometimes when they would do it Japanese style, they would get to that, have you ever heard of, like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? You know, nothing. So you go thinking about that over and over and over again, and you get to this, this uh, where your mind is just empty. Because that's the goal. You're trying not to have anything in your mind. And he, he mentions these things, which are scientific, and we'll go through a little bit of it. Um, you start going through this thing called the alpha wave. And that's like when, before you go to sleep. And then when you transition into that sleep wave, it's the theta wave. These are scientific. You can check them. Um, so what happens then is that in your brain, your amygdala calms down, almost like you're sedated. And then your, your brain starts to secrete dopamine. And dopamine is kind of addictive. If you, that's where you get the runner's high that they talk about. You know, it's dopamine. And you know, at that moment, he mentions that you can start visualizing things. You see gods or images because your mind is in this neural state. You're, you're in an altered mind. Um, and there, so he talks about this neuroscientist, Andrew Newberg, and he, they did studies on what is happening here. And when they were doing studies on people doing meditation through mantra, through um, their breathing exercises, through counting, whatever it was, um, he saw all those things that I had just mentioned, but then what he saw too is that the parietal lobe, this, you know, because you're blocking everything that's coming from into your frontal lobe. You're trying not to have thoughts. And then your parietal lobe back here, it shuts down. It, and you know what that means? And, it's, and this, kind of is, this is kind of important, is that you lose where you are in 3D space when your parietal lobe goes down. So what does that mean for the meditators doing this kind of meditation? Is that now I am part of the universe. I am, you know, I, I am one with the universe. The universe is within me, within me, and pretty much I am the universe. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? And it, when it happens, it's dramatic, supposedly. You know, when you're combining the dopamine, the alpha waves, it's euphoric. So when the Buddhists, when it happens to the Buddhists, they say that you've been awakened. When it happens to the Hindus, they say you've reached nirvana. But then Christian meditation, Christian meditation has take and taken and adopted some of these ideas, just like instead of using mantras or mm, the mantra that they use may be scripture, but it's just getting them into that same mindset. And it's a bit dangerous because then they'll say, well, you've had a God encounter. And 
the thing is that they're all just neural phenomena. And the mantras lead you to that kind of altered mind. When we look biblically at what meditation should be, like, uh, for example, uh, he was mentioning about Psalm 19. And I, it's a long psalm, so I don't expect you, you know, I wasn't going to read it today. But I'm going to explain it a little bit. Uh, so take your time, read Psalm 19 at some point today. But you see David here observing the universe. He was observing the handiwork of God. He was an observer. In his visualization, he saw the sun looking mighty, like a mighty man, the bridegroom. And he asked God, please show me the secret, my secret faults, because he wanted to be pure. He trusted God so much that he said, please show me who I am when I'm alone, when I'm in secret, because he didn't trust himself. It was a trust relationship between he and God. So when you compare the two outcomes of true biblical meditation and more of the Eastern style of meditation. You know, you have the Eastern that keeps you calm, tranquil, euphoric, but those are all feelings. You're not forced to confront anything because your mind is altered. But in biblical meditation, in, lo in a love relationship, in confrontation, your mind is alert in that beta wave. It's the fast wave, rapid, alert, questioning, thinking. You confront your weaknesses and sins as you begin to see him and who he is. It then forces you to see who you are compared to his majesty. And here's the key. It's I am nothing, which is the way it should be, versus I am everything, which is what they teach. I hope that made sense. I know it's, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but when I think about it, too, we shouldn't have an empty mind. An empty mind is kind of a dangerous mind. Um, I remember a pastor speaking recently. Uh, I think it's Taj Pakleb. Yes. Um, but he was talking about the Taj Mahal. And it was just, you know, a short video. And it was, it was cool. You know, he showed the Taj Mahal from a distance. He came up close on it. It was beautiful very ornate, so many jewels. But when he went inside, it was nothing. It was kind of empty. There was not a place to sit. There wasn't, you know, the whole idea of the Taj Mahal was that it was, you know, it's pretty much a tomb for a couple people. And so it didn't really have a purpose. It was empty. That's what he was going on. And he talked a little bit about something different. But, I mean, our mind also should not be empty like that. It should have a purpose. It should be filled with something good. Um, let's see. I think I do have one more. Because I, I don't know why it's highlighted. But um, this, I heard another speaker talking about this, this verse, and it reminded me, so I put it in here. But let's read it. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he had come, he find it empty, swept, and garnished. Then, I'm sorry, this is King James. Then goeth he and taketh himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so it shall be unto this wicked generation." Uh, the reason I thought about this is that, you know, we might be able to clear our mind. And it's good. We need to be able to turn the volume of things down. We need to be able to get bad things out of our head. But if we don't fill it, if we do not fill our mind and our heart with good things, we just leave a vacuum for the bad to come back. And to come back worse, according to the, the Bible verse. Well, in closing, so this, thank you for walking through this with me all this time, and now we are close to the end, but I do want to share this, this is an example, and I, I'm just going to read it. Um, this is one of my favorite thoughts on meditation. 
Um, and this is about Enoch. And this is uh, Mrs. White's writing, uh, writing this. And I think it's a beautiful story. And, I ha and after I read through this, you know, I'll touch base on a couple of them before we close. So of Enoch, it was written that he lived 65 years and begat a son. After he walked with God 300 years, after that, he walked with God 300 years. During those earlier years, Enoch had loved and feared God and kept his commandments. But after the birth of his first son, he reached a higher experience. He was drawn into a closer relationship with God. As he saw the child's love for its father, its simple trust in, in his protection, as he felt the deep yearning tenderness of his own heart for that firstborn son, he learned a precious lesson of the wonderful love of God to man in the gift of his son. And the confidence which the children of God may repose in their heavenly father. The infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ became the subject of his meditations day and night. With all the fervor of his soul, he sought to reveal that love to the people among whom he dwelt. His faith waxed stronger. His love became more ardent with the lapse of centuries. And I, this is one of the things I highlighted. To him, prayer was the breath of the soul. He lived in the atmosphere of heaven. The power of God that wrought, with, that wrought with his servant was felt by those who heard. Some gave heed to the warning and renounced their sins, but the multitudes mocked at the solemn message. For 300 years, Enoch had, had been seeking purity of heart that he might be in harmony with heaven. For three centuries, he had walked with God. Day by day, he had longed for a closer union. Nearer and nearer had grown the communion until God took him to himself. He had stood at the threshold of the eternal world, only a step between him and the land of the blessed. And now the portals opened, the walk with God, so long pursued on earth, continued. And he passed through the gates of, of the holy city, the first among men to enter there. The, the reason this, I like this so much is because, well, there's, there's many reasons. But one of the things is, did, God serve, or did Enoch serve a different God than we do? No. Did Enoch have any advantage over us? Was, he, was there any power that he could have that we couldn't have? No. I mean, when we, once we get to that point, when we decide to follow after Jesus, and it is life-changing, then our thoughts and our actions and what we do will reflect Jesus more and more. And the thing that I find so beautiful is that even though we live in this world now and we go through what we're going through, we can live in the atmosphere of heaven. How beautiful is that? And the, there's another, um, I read this again in a different um, book, but she was also talking about how, you know, that, that walk was so close with God that when it came for that moment, to cross the threshold, it was so normal for him that he didn't even realize that he had passed from this life into the next life, that he was translated. And I just hope that, you know, through prayer, through meditation, um, that we can experience that as well. I mean, I hope you're excited about that. I am, you know, I'm looking forward to spending more time in his word, seeking out what it says, and having him explain it to me. So also, you know, Pastor Junie had asked, you know, this is, this is it, um, <laughs> I swear. But he had asked, like, what would be the good closing hymn? And I said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just like, you know, something that focuses our eyes on God. But then I started thinking about it. You know, it really is beautiful. When you know those words, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And then it says, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. I think as we focus on God more and more, this world will become less and less important to us. So thank you very much, and you know, praise God.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we want to thank you so much for this Sabbath. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we've been able to share with each other. Lord, thank you so much for sharing your word with us. Lord, we ask that you would be in each one of us and lead us through this week that's upcoming. Lord, we pray that we would find a deeper, deeper relationship with you through prayer, through meditation. Lord, let us walk the path that you've set before us. Lord, I pray that we focus so hard on you that this world does become more dim and we start focusing on it less and less and you more and more. Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we go home. We pray that you would bless those that have been watching over the internet. And I pray that um, you can help us to live lives that glorify you. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.